Hi, everyone. I'm David Williams, president of strategy consulting firm Health Business Group and host of the Health Biz Podcast, a weekly show where I interview top healthcare entrepreneurs about their lives and their careers. If you like this episode, please do hit that like button and subscribe. My guest today is Dr. Rob Coleman. He is co-founder and CEO of Codagenics. Rob, thank you for joining me on the Health Biz Podcast today. Oh, my pleasure, David. It's glad to be here. So. You're doing all sorts of interesting stuff right now, and I'm just guessing you've been doing interesting stuff your whole life. So I'd be interested to hear a little bit about your your background, sort of your your uh, what your upbringing was like, and any childhood influences that may have stuck with you. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, the coolest thing about Codagenics is I'm also co-inventor of the technology with my, my other two co-founders. So nice. I was actually the scientist pipetting and testing the virus that's the basis of the technology along with Stefan Mueller, our CSO, and Eckerd Wimmer, National Academy of Science member, also co-founder of the, the company. I had really great early influences because I come from a family of entrepreneurial scientists. So my, my grandfather was a physicist, actually a garage inventor. So always encouraged to pursue what he saw as the next generation or the next frontier of science, which was molecular biology, synthetic biology encouraged me to go to Stony Brook and, and join the lab. And so it was a really nice progression of family of entrepreneurial scientists encouraging what they saw as the growth industry and me having a really, you know, early beginning in molecular biology at Cold Spring Harbor and other places. So jumped right yep. into Eckerd's lab and started working on the, the project that is the basis for Codagenics. Yeah. So pretty straightforward. So what, what kind of, what kind of garage physics were we talking yeah, about? Yeah. He worked on um, sort of solid, plasma or excuse me plasma desp- deposition and other things it's 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 not that relevant but um yeah uh, that's good i'm just wondering just cool, if like so. what the neighbors thought you know depending on what you're doing <laughs> in the garage you know? yeah he had a large garage so yeah okay that's good insulin so least... they couldn't hear what was happening but no nah, just just being funny but uh no he worked on he worked on sort of uniform deposition of materials on an object and um, yeah super cool stuff yeah that's excellent and so then um so how did that influence sort of your, what you decided to do for school and, you know, what was your yeah. experience like in school? Well, always like a supreme science, right? It was asking, you know, when I was even young, what's two to the fourth? And yeah, and uh, he would, he would also, you know, just emphasize science and he didn't say you have to do physics, right? Yeah. Just drawn to molecular biology. I'm from Long Island and Cold Spring Harbor is there. Right. And so... I got early on involved in the Cold Spring Harbor, you know, DNA laboratory working in labs as, as young as seventh grade. So I would take a class with high school students as a, you know, in the summer as a seventh grader, yeah, just doing the molecular biology. And so that sort of gave me a leg up, I would say in grad school yeah. where I already knew how to do a lot of the basics. And so I could jump right in with Eckerd and Stefan and the computer scientists that we also co-invented the technology with really hit the ground running and, and help build on what all of the amazing work Eckerd had already done and then try this yeah. new way to design viruses. And that sort of sort of all came together for me. You know, it, it didn't look from your uh, resume, it didn't look like you necessarily worked in business per se before Codagenics. Is that is that right? Yeah, or that's accurate. Was, I mean, yeah. I did. So I was a grad student on this project and then I went and actually utilized the approach as a postdoc getting my MBA simultaneously, you know, thanks to my wife helping support the, the family because yeah. she was the breadwinner at the time. Um, and then we came back together and, and founded the company together, myself, Stefan and Eckerd. You know, we invented this amazing technology that's the basis of Codagenics. It was unfortunate timing because it was like late 2008, early 2009. And interestingly enough, we ran into some VCs later in life and said, you know, we looked at the technology. It was just a tough time to start a company around it. It was fortuitous for Stefan and myself because we could actually then start the company with Eckerd. And so we got together at his birthday party in, I guess that was 2011, maybe. Yeah. Was it in a garage? No, it wasn't in a garage. (laughs) It was was near Stony Brook where he lives. And we said, man, the data is so good and has so much potential. No one's coming to, you know, work on the technology. Let's just start the company ourselves. And that and that's what we did. Getting our first funding from the US government and then a subsequent A and B rounds. 
So now, on what basis was the was the government funding it? What what kind of yeah? We had a we had a grant from from NIH. It was to support. So the initial discovery of the platform, so Coleman 2008 Science, was using polio virus, which at the time was sort of just a, a model, right? Because we th- yeah the world thought polio virus was solving. I was gone. Clearing. I was less, less yesterday's yeah. news, you know. But. but the grant was to say, okay, now let's build this and use the platform on a on a, a virus of relevance. So we started working yeah. on flu, and we started working on other things like like dengue, and those were supported by NIH and. Um, also, a grant from the USDA on a on an agri- on a on a uh, agricultural vaccine that's still in, in development. And so, once we had that initial government funding, seed funding, proof of concept that we could actually apply the technology to another relevant virus, then we were able to attract our Series A investors, and then also our and then in turn, you know, Series B. So, you know, they have uh, they talk about uh, different time frames for founding companies, and sure. sometimes when the macro environment uh, is tough, like when you were there, it may actually cause you okay go slower, but it also means you don't have a bunch of competitors that get ahead, and you also get to do things at the right pace as opposed to hey we're throwing tons of money at this, we got to like, hire all yeah. sorts of people and do all sorts of things. I think we were you know some of the criticism maybe of Codagenics is what has taken you so long, but the taking long has actually been really. Firstly, I mean, always thanks to our early investors for being extraordinarily patient, but their patience has really paid off. We're in phase three now with one of our programs and they allowed us to learn how to apply. Essentially what Codagenics does is we synth. So why Eckert is so famous, he was the first to synthesize a virus from small pieces of DNA. And it was really revolutionary because if you can synthesize a virus, you can redesign it however you want. And so the core for Codagenics is we redesign viruses, converting them from virulent pathogen that makes you sick into live attenuated vaccine. And so there was a learning curve there for Codagenics of how to use that algorithm appropriately, which portions of the virus to modify to turn it into a vaccine. And now we've really have this like exponential growth phase where we have a diverse pipeline and all of that really patient learning. So I'm always indebted to our early investors. And maybe you're right. I mean, that time frame was perfect where the macro environment was terrible and it allowed us to incubate and grow from really two people, right? To 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 30 now and growing yeah. as we speak. So no, it's definitely, you know, what happens, of course, in, in the hard times is that uh, some good things that really need their upfront funding don't get it. They don't receive it because there's just nothing available. And so that's bad. But the ones that sort of tough it out sometimes can be good. The reverse is also true. And you saw it like sort of during the dot-com boom earlier. And then I think we're seeing it now in things like digital health, where there's all sorts of money available. And frankly, a lot of clowns got funded. And then, you know, sort of the waters recede and you're like, okay, who are these guys and what are they doing? And, you know, why is this business needed? And often the answer is it it isn't. Uh, So you're probably in a good spot from that. So you started to describe a little bit about sort of your your platform and being able to you know, synthesize a virus from you know different pieces of, of DNA and being able to redesign it from a pathogen to uh, an attenuated uh, vaccine. Can you, if I've if I've said that right, if you can sort of characterize that within sort of the more traditional types of uh, of approaches to vaccine development that were being done earlier, and you know what's happened uh, more recently that's gotten all the all the news on the kind of mRNA side. Yeah, I think the world really had like a crash course in vaccinology, right? And sure. And I think Codagenics gets lumped into platforms because, in my opinion, all the other platforms are actually really, really similar in the sense that they only are really a way to deliver a protein of the target to the immune system. Now, it could be an mRNA expressing that protein, a virus like particle carrying the protein or a Trojan horse virus like Johnson and Johnson expressing that protein. So they're really antigen focused or antigen delivery mechanisms. And so what's really, and in my opinion, the best, the true best class of vaccines are what are called live attenuated, Mm -hmm. meaning it's a weak version of the virus, but it doesn't just have spike. It has all the protein. So the measles vaccine, for example, a s- extraordinary human achievement, right? Because it's being you can get it as a kid. You're protected against measles for a, potentially your life, one or two doses. It doesn't just have the glycoprotein of measles. It is measles. It's just a weak version. Yeah. And so people usually ask, well, why don't we just do that for everything? 
is because the way those original live vaccines were made is through what's called serial passage or really trial and error, random mutation. They yeah. take a virus, randomly mutate it, hoping it would become a vaccine. So basically you have, uh, so I read something, and I don't, I don't, I'm not a pet owner, but I read something about like someone's cat and it's like, does your cat want to eat you? And it said, you know, it's just like a bigger cat, like a puma or something would. And the little cat wants to, but, you know, it, it can't. So this is like the <laughs> virus happened to be, you know, they just made like a really wimpy one. And you get used to beating that one up. And then you can take on the big guy. Exactly. When he comes it's my cat analogy. Sorry for any cat lovers. A cat analogy doesn't really go any further. I'm not talking about harming a cat. But there's something about it's a wimpy one. You get to practice on that. And then you're built up and you can handle the big guy when he comes after you. Yeah. And with the great thing about live vaccines, one, two doses and the key if you sort of overlay with what we're seeing with covid now because everyone's paying attention is this emergent of variants right yeah and variants emerge because the antibodies against one don't work against the new version of the virus and this is where live vaccines come in they provide all proteins and so if the spike starts to mutate you still have an immune response against the other proteins and so just to circle back though of why the, that a traditional approach didn't work was because in order to make that virus weak, it was completely random change. Yeah. They would just take a human virus, put it in chicken cells or chicken eggs to try to make it less human-like, right? And turn it safe. And so the real breakthrough, if we circle back all the way to what Ecker did, and if you think about that traditional live, it really de dependent on the natural sequence of the virus and hope that it becomes attenuated. Yeah. And so that that hope process or trial and error process is really of unknown length of time and unknown cost, right? Because you would passage yeah. it. Does it work or not? If not, keep passaging. You know, sometimes like, in, I don't know if they taught you this where you went to business school and I didn't learn it in business school, but later they say, you know, hope is not a strategy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what, you know, Codagenics, no randomness. It's completely yeah. rational design. So, and to now say what makes our platform different is we're a synthetic biology company. We analyze the human genome to understand ways to recode genetic material so that it's slowly translated by the human host cell. Now that's maybe hard to digest, but at the highest level, if you think about it, it doesn't matter if it's Zika or flu or COVID in your nose, that wild type virus wants to come in and it wants to make a trillion copies of itself yeah. more or less in eight hours. So they they have made their genes super, super efficient. And so what Codagenics did is we analyzed the human genome and we found preferences and essentially sequences that are avoided. And so our algorithm takes that wild type, efficiently translated, fast translated viral sequence. It recodes it using those, that matrix of bad codons, if you will, or slow sequences. We then use Eckerd's approach to stitch that back into the virus. And now we have converted wild type pathogen rationally into live attenuated vaccine and when we make these changes, it's hundreds of changes, not thousands, so we can show it can't revert. And that's really the big next step for Codagenics and how we have an approach to make next generation live vaccines. We have all the benefits of live vaccine, and we've taken out the risk of reversion, and we've taken out the long timelines of random change. So, so you sort of know what it is that the, the wild type sort of fast replicating virus, what it's trying to avoid. And he sort of used that. We uh, force it to be encoded in those bad, the yeah. bad language for the human host cell. Yeah. And it's so forced it can't make one change and hop back. Yeah. So um, you sort of turn it into a moron. <laughs> yeah. Or, I, you know, the analogy I use is like the wild type virus is like a Ferrari with a Ferrari yeah. engine. Ours looks like the Ferrari because the coolest thing about our algorithm is we leave the protein sequence that change uh, the same. We just change the DNA sequence to have these slowly translated uh, sequences. And so it's like the Ferrari, which you make your immune response to all the pieces of the Ferrari, right? Tire, hood. Yeah. It's not just the hood of the Ferrari. Um, okay. But on the inside, it has like this VW engine to yeah, yeah. To, to go slow. So Yeah. All right. No, that's, uh, that's, that's that an sounds, analogy. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds good. Uh, not everybody has a Ferrari around, but I'm glad. Oh, yes. Uh, well, I'm trying to use something that's fast. I don't know. Exactly. Corvette. Okay. <laughs> yeah. No, those, those, are, those are good. All right. So now, so it sounds like like incredible sort of scientific story. And you can see where the big need is. And like you said, everybody's become like a, you know, amateur virologist now. I think you know, more broadly sort of 
you know, if you try to talk to people about clinical trials three years ago, it's like, what are you talking about? Suddenly everybody is their own expert about, you know, emergency youth authorization versus full approval and, you know, what's a, how does this clinical trial work and all that. So now there's a lot of interest in it for sure. Um, now, where are you going to go in terms of, uh, you know, the company and in terms of having now the, the impact from this, uh, this platform approach? You, you're in phase three. What are you in phase? What are you, what are you going to phase three with? Well, we're right now. So for COVID, we're in phase a phase three trans, uh, trial. So it's a placebo controlled efficacy trial mm-hmm. for intranasal COVID vaccine sponsored by the WHO. It's in the solidarity vaccine trial. It's occurring in multiple geographical locations in Africa, soon to be South America, potentially Southeast Asia as well, as a primary vaccine looking to protect against COVID infection. So there's a placebo group and there's an active group. So we're a phase three company now that's fully funded and supported by both uh, WHO and our commercial partner, Serum Institute India. Um, We also have a diverse pipeline. So you can see that we can apply the algorithm not to just COVID, right? And it's not a backbone virus expressing spike. We can apply the algorithm essentially to any virus. So we've also targeted RSV, which is a serious respiratory pathogen. We have an IND for that. We also just got fast track designation from the FDA um, based on our right. based on our data. Also working on dengue, which is a big global issue yep. supported by the DOD. So, I mean, I'm not sure about which program you want to talk about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let's start. COVID, uh, let's actually start by talking about the nose. Sure. So you mentioned before about the Ferrari jumping in your nose, or whatever it was that you that you okay. said. But you know, one of the things I've heard about. Um, you know, the, the COVID vaccines, uh, which of course has been, you know, a very interesting uh, and successful story from a lot of standpoints is that, you know, maybe the lack of, uh, the, the, there's sort of a need for intranasal uh, approach, um, which would be great if, if you agree with that, or just to hear like, what, why do people say that? And then why, why are you taking that approach uh, as yeah. well? What's the relationship to the platform? I mean, I think, I mean, the platform goes wherever the natural virus goes. Yeah. So our dengue program is an injectable COVID goes in your nose. We're starting to, we started to explore it as an intranasal vaccine. I think there's definitely a palpable push for mucosal vaccine, especially yeah. for respiratory viruses, because we know that the virus is here. It's probably going to be here for a very yeah. long time. It's going to be circulating. It's going to be mutating. We need a, in a way to not just protect the person against severe disease with antibodies, we need to be able to g- provide some sort of block, right? To slow the process down of, of transmission. And, mu- and the only way to really do that is through a mucosal vaccine. Um, and I think there's really a palpable push in the scientific community, regulatory governments. I think we're in like the figure it out stage yeah. for those things. But I think there's definitely a need and a desire to get these across the finish line because we know their potential of blocking transmission, blocking circulation, slowing down the progress of the, of the virus. Got it. And so that approach can can work well for like a respiratory virus that by definition is floating around in the air and you're going to yes. probably take it in through your nose or your mouth uh, yes. is the way it would work. Okay. So where do you expect things to go then sort of, you know, more broadly, you, you mentioned a number of programs, you know, RSV, dengue are, are examples that you're, that you're working on. If you look at your vision for five to 10 years from now, you know, where, where, where do you go? uh, Yeah. I mean, we have a very, you know, diverse pipeline with a lot of potential for out license from out licensing to taking ourselves all the way with a product like yellow fever and doing it all on our own. I think for COVID we have the potential for commercial commercialization in 23 based on the, on the, the COVID vaccine and the results of the of the phase three trial. And so the long-term vision is to, you know, divert we have a lot of options ahead of us. It'll be data dependent from yeah. out licensing to going public to just staying private to carrying a vaccine like yellow fever all the way to market, uh, which we have the potential to do. And so it's I, it's maybe it's a little bit cloudy, but it's not cloudy like we're unsure. It's like there's yeah. a lot of optionality that's data dependent. And I think, you know, I think in this biotech environment that we're in, I think 
why Codogenics is attractive is because we have a lot of shots on goal, if you will, but we also have a lot of optionality with the platform, new targets, uh, and also a very, you know, not a singular commercial path relying on a singular data point. So I think that's why it's a really exciting time for Codogenics. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I mentioned yellow fever before the, uh, you know, the onset uh, of the public health emergency. I have a yellow fever card that I carry around uh, with me because okay. I'm, I'm traveling. And I remember um, when I was, uh, I, I was going to Africa and around that time, around 08, actually, is when you were okay. getting going. And they said I needed yellow fever vaccination, although it wasn't like totally clear if you actually needed it. I was going to Uganda and I was like transiting some places and, and, then, and there was a shortage of the vaccine too. And I remember still a shortage. Said, yeah, I don't know manufacturing issues or whatever they told me okay they're going to call me like when they break open a vial they're going to call me and they get like you know however many people lined up that are going to have it and i and i told the person well i don't know if i really you know i really need it etc and so they brought this old guy out of the back room you know some <laughs> some guy that had been around for 100 years and he, and his argument was uh you know you probably won't get it but if you get it if you get it we can't save you and then the other the other argument was if I don't give it to you here, you may find when you're crossing a border, they're going to give it to you there. And I can't promise like the height, you know, how the hygiene of their needles and so on. So I, he kind of got me. It's like <laughs> a couple of good arguments. It's yeah, if you get it, you could die. Some people aren't going to like that because, you know, eh, what's the chance of that? And then, but the other one is like, okay, you can see yourself in one of these airports, you know, and they're, they're getting you. And that, that was more the argument that got me. And I think that that's actually a good argument, but yeah. so you may have something that I, I can just get a little, well, that wouldn't be a, a is that going to be in? Well, the cool, you know, the why is there a continual shortage for yellow fever yeah, vaccine? Why? Really speak, it relies on eggs okay. for production. So the tradition, the yellow fever vaccine was made in the early 1900s. I mean, crazy how long ago. Serial passaging in eggs, it gets egg mutations. If you move it, so eggs are a bottleneck. Yeah, you you cannot move that vaccine strain to tr- you know the more modern cellular production because the vi- virus reverts and it becomes not safe anymore or the, excuse me the vaccine right. reverts yeah. and not safe so they're stuck with the eggs and so this is what creates this global bottleneck what Codogenics has been able to do is we've now made a yellow fever vaccine strain entering clinical testing sometime next year that can be made in traditional cell based production Got it. So we've eliminated the need for eggs. Um, and the coolest thing about yellow fever is it doesn't need a placebo-controlled efficacy trial like other indications. It has a surrogate endpoint established by the FDA, meaning you just need to show a certain level of immunity from the vaccine for licensure. And so this is why we're quite bullish on our yellow fever vaccine is because we could demonstrate it can be produced in cheaply in, yeah. in non-eggs. And, and we can pursue this surrogate endpoint from the FDA. And so one of our other investors, so our, our Series B lead investor was uh, Adjuvant Capital, super awesome supporters, but also have a global health mission. Yeah. And so that's why we picked up Yellow Fever. Like we have to solve this. And we, at least preclinically, we've shown in monkeys, safe, immunogenic, can be made in cells and it does not revert. And so now we're really pushing that one, that one forward. So one of the things that was notable about you know the the recent uh, public health emergency that we're still uh, emerging from is the idea that maybe with climate change and with things that are going on from just a you know mobility of population that there's going to be more new viruses emerging um, and with the, with this one you know the mRNA vaccines came along very fast so on the one hand you know you talk about how there's a lot of potential things that you could go after uh, how would you compare let's say when the, something new emerges that uh, you know, are you going to be able to be fast as well, or are you going to lose the race to somebody else? You know, I, we were maybe five months behind Pfizer from their yeah. phase one dosing. And this is where we're, we're an emerging biotech. Right. And a lot of the limitation was not necessarily recovery of the vaccine strain, but more actual limitation of places to do the preclinical work to support. Yeah. So, um, but now, for example, for our yellow fever vaccine, just how fast codogenics can move yeah. from receipt of synthetic DNA in our lab that encoded the vaccine to recovery was only 18 days. Yeah. So we went from test tube DNA to live attenuated candidate vaccine in, in a few weeks. So we can move really, really fast, especially with viruses where we know where to apply our de-optimization or our codon modification or slow DNA sequence too. And so we can move 
we could move relatively fast. We're a small, you know, always impressed yeah. by my scientific team of how they're able to do this so quickly. That used to be me, but now I just get to watch my, yeah. man, man, you guys are better than, it's <laughs> like, better wow. than I was. So this is awesome. Yeah. yeah maybe, maybe, maybe be better coach than a player. Yeah. Um, exactly. So, and, and it sounds like what you're saying is that there should be, you know, you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast about how the attenuated vaccines are probably superior and so if you can go roughly at the same speed, even though it's others, you know, fast ones, you have the opportunity possibly to have something that's going to be better. Wasn't that the polio vaccine wasn't there originally a, an attenuated one? And then a, it and was. Then a, yeah. So yeah. it's a great it's a it's a an example of the liabilities of traditional lives. So it only has three nucleotide changes in the vaccine yeah. strain. So when those revert, the virus can become pathogenic. And that's yeah. really the, you know, the lab where we came from polio, we wanted to help solve this problem of potential reversion. So we got together with the computer science department and thought, what's a way we can put so many mutations into this virus that it can never wiggle out. Yeah. And that's really the overall idea of Codagenics, a platform, redesigned genetic material that it's impossible or close to impossible. And, you know, a scientist, you never want to say zero. No, percent, don't say but, that. Yeah. But, but theoretically close to impossible that the virus does re doesn't revert. And we've been able to actually show that in our clinical programs now. So if you take the COVID vaccine out of the nose of the participant, it's there for a little bit of time yeah. to safe levels. We pull it out, no mutations in the deoptimized region. Yeah, And so we can nice. actually prove that clinically now. So let me just uh, turn away from all what you're doing, Codagenics. It's very interesting and ask, do you have any time for any pleasure reading? And if so, do you have anything that you would, uh, that you'd recommend? Yeah. So I, you know, I have two, there's two books that I like. Actually, the first one, I loved it as a kid and I just read it to my five-year-old son the other night. Go Doggo is a great book. Yeah. Um, it's very simple. Suspense, right? Where are these dogs all going to? Um, my son, James, really loves it. The other book that I just read, Thinking Fast and Slow. Yeah. Yeah. Daniel Kahneman. Yes. Yeah. How to get out of your own bias, right? Your brain yeah. is a little lazy. It's like, I, that's the easy answer. That's the one I'm going to pick. And so I tried to be as objective as possible through through all things. And it's just a fantastic book to read. So I can't decide which one is better. I mean, yeah, well, they both have their, you know, the Go Dog Go is a little simpler. Um, you know, the, the Kahneman one, you got to read it pretty carefully to yeah. uh, to be able to, to get at it. And it's like they talk about these different systems, like the fast one and the slow one and how they exactly. work together. I, uh, you know, you mentioned your, your upbringing. My, my father was... Uh, uh, social psychologist and I was studying economics in uh, college and he thought economics was stupid you know because it assumes the uh, rational man which is you're <laughs> sort of assuming away all the right stuff and so he had gave me these papers by Kahneman and, and his collaborator uh, Amos Tversky that were all about sort of all the you know non-rational uh, things that people actually do so uh, and he didn't give me go dog go but I did read go dog go to my uh, to my kids as well so those are those are two good ones so well I appreciate that well, Dr. Rob Coleman, I want to say thank you, uh, CEO of Codagenics, for, uh, for participating today on the Health Biz Podcast and for all that you're doing uh, uh, you know, to bottle up those, uh, those viruses and keep okay, them from causing trouble. Thank you, David. It's been great. You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come, and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.